Let the church say amen. amen. Come on, we can do better than that. Let the church say amen. amen. If it's been good to you and you find reason in this season to shout hallelujah, can I see 10 people just stand on their feet and declare that we serve an awesome God? That he is indeed a way maker. If God has delivered you from something, can you just raise your hand? You're in this place. Day. And we know the Lord has a word in this place on this day in this season. And we praise God for what he's about to do and what he's done all 45 years long. I am really peacock proud to be here for many reasons. It is not easy to find yourself considering yourself as the son of the soil. It was at this church that I reckon my experience to be not a good one, but a great one. I am really humbled to be here. I'd like to thank your pastor and the committee that entertained such an occasion for me to return back to my home church and to preach a word uh, to God's people. And I really couldn't be here without all of you. And I'm going to ask, please, for some pastor privilege. I'm going to ask if you prayed for this man, and you fasted for this man, if you can sit on your two good feet so I can acknowledge you with a spirit of thanksgiving. Please, if you prayed for me before I went off to Oakwood, if you know that you've asked God to watch over me, I want you please to stand on your two feet. Come on, come on, come on. God bless you. 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 Good to see you, Doc, in the back. God bless you. I want to say to you today that this church is really a blessed place. When I was listening to George share in the words of reflection about this church, I couldn't help but to remember Sister Ward. Yeah. Who sat in the back. She had her own chair. Do you hear me? And you better not sit in Sister Ward's chair. If you sat in Sister Ward's chair, Brother Shaw would come up beside you. And back then, he didn't just tap you and say, get up. He would put his hands on your ear. And he would be filled with the Holy Ghost to squeeze that thing so hard, you thought you were seeing the second coming. But I praise God for all of you and all that have now become to understand the great Downs U Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, this church produced Olympic runners. Sister Bowen, they don't know. This church produced doctors and teachers and preachers, psychiatrists and entrepreneurs. And I want you to know, my friends, that you are not just in a church, a place where God is doing great things and will continue to do so. So I ask of you, please continue to pray for this church, continue to be faithful to this church, because I do believe the best is yet to come. Help but to see some of my good friends this, this afternoon have mercy. My brother Cecil Lewis in the house. Cecil, come on, man. Stand on your feet, my brother. Nigel Hunter. Come on, man. Stand on your feet. And I think of mercy, it has been at least 15 years. It is good to see you, my brother. Listen, church, I know you come to worship the Lord, but I got to take this time to acknowledge just a few other folks. My parents are in the house. And I praise God for them because when I didn't love Jesus like I should, they kept on taking me to Downsview. So I'm going to ask my mom and dad, could you please stand on your feet? These are the prayer warriors in our camp. And we praise God for them. Oh, bless the Lord, all my soul and all that is within me. Thank you for that, sir. Thank you for that. that. That is my parents there. We praise God for them that they're still in the land of the living. We bless you on today, mom and dad, and we thank you for your sacrificial servitude spirit 
to all of your children. I think I have my siblings in the house. The only one that's not here is uh, Greg. Uh, he's still in Huntsville, Alabama. But Carolyn, you should be here. My niece, Alicia, you should be here. Come on and stand. Uh, see, you all act too shy when y'all, there you go, all right. So, oh, no, 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 you gotta stand better than that. All right, and, and Carolyn, come on, Kiana, my sister Chanel, my brother-in-law Mikey, we praise God for all of you today. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate those six hand claps, yeah, yeah. I see Uncle Verley in the house, God bless you Uncle Verley, you and my dad were wearing a shirt, we will not show that again. I don't know what y'all were doing on that screen, showing your muscles and all of that. And my family has come uh, all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, and we praise God for them. My wife, they were mentioned before. Olivia, can you stand? This is the queen and the first lady of my castle. She's holding my namesake, Marvin Jr. My daughter, Madison. Come on, Madison, stand up. She's the only rose amongst thorns of the boys. And then my firstborn, Micaiah. Yeah, big man now, almost taller than me. And my other son, Miles, is sleeping. That doesn't mean that the service is too long. It just means that he didn't sleep well last night. But we praise God for him. Miles, could you stand up? Somebody woke you up. That's good. Yes, that's him. You can't see him, but he's there, I promise you. And so I praise God for all of us that are here to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth as we celebrate 45 years of excellence. 45 years of excellence. I, I could not go a little further without acknowledging Sister Pat Simmons. She, she used to have a choir called God's Power. And we really didn't like the purple and gold. Uh, we, we thought it was really corny. Uh, but, but we still wore it anyways because that's what children do. And so we praise God for Sister Pat Simmons who is in South Florida, Miami. We praise God if you're watching online, we celebrate you on today as well. Now, I got to tell you something. When I was a little boy, uh, I, I remember there was this young lady, and I'm married now, bless the Lord, but there was this young lady that I felt when I was about 15 that she was my girlfriend. And every Sabbath I saw her, Nigel, every Sabbath she would come to me and she would give me one dollar. Now I want you to think about that. 52 Sabbaths a year and Fianna, she would give me a dollar every single Sabbath. Now y'all, see, you guys don't get it. But when you're 14, 12, 9 and you're getting 52 dollars, and she's not related to you you really enjoy this young lady and so on today uh, I, I have to put her on the spot it's unexpected it's not planned but I know that the anointing is on her all the time and I'm gonna ask my dear sister Sharon Riley who I used to call my yes who I used to call my girlfriend growing up can you please just come up here and minister to us? It only makes sense. Can the church say amen? You can't have her in the building and not have her. And I know she's going to be as all mad as get out at me. But somebody just real quickly, just say, give grace to the preacher. When things are nice, we do it twice. Say, give grace to the preacher. And I'm going to ask her, please, please. I I'm not asking for a dollar today. I just want you to minister. Please, just minister to us. A anything, anything. Let the Spirit lead, please. Only because I love Marvin. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never failed me all my days. You've been held in my hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Ooh, I will think of the goodness of God Okay, 
say for 45 years we have all said all our lives you have been faithful the church say amen anybody can testify all your life in seen and unseen moments the Lord has been good to you can somebody say hallelujah in this place bless the name of the Lord all right we'll go right into the word we praise God for that thank you so much sister Sharon Riley we bless the Lord for you on today if you've been so kind to allow your Bibles to accompany you to church, or if you have a copy of your Bible, I want to bring your attention as we celebrate on this anniversary of 45 years, a text of teaching that I feel the Holy Spirit has led us on this day. It's a familiar passage. It's coming from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. When you find it, please rest on your feet in honor of God's word. Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. God bless you, faithful readers. Amen. Amen. Elder Bowen, good to see you in the house. Sister Bowen, good to see you in the house. Send our love back to T. West, please. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. If you haven't found it, say, wait for me, preacher. I hear you. I'll wait. I'll wait. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. Please, we're all resting on our feet this afternoon in honor of God's word, in honor of God's word. When we go to the courthouse, we got to rise to our feet. But when you're in the presence of the Lord, if you're able, we ought to rise on our feet. And the word of God says to the people of God on this afternoon, as we celebrate 45 years at the Downs U Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Bible declares, and it came to pass that after these things, that God did tempt Abraham. Some of your Bibles will say tested Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2 says, And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Verse three says, and Abraham rose up early in the morning, somebody say early, and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went onto the place of which God had told him. Verse four. Then the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Verse 5 says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Verse 6 says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and went 
both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And Downs, you said, God, how can we pay for the mortgage? And God said, the Lord will have to provide a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both of them together, the word says. And verse 9 says, and they came to the place which God had told him. Of and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Verse 10 says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11 tells us, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Verse 12 says, And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. Verse 13, our final verse for our sermonic spotlight this afternoon. And the word says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son this afternoon I want to preach and teach as a spirit shall guide with this sermonic spotlight in mind and here it is the journey broke my heart but it fixed my vision the journey broke my heart would fix my vision. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, uh-oh, I'm, I'm giving you preaching rights this afternoon. So you got to sound like a preacher. Say, neighbor. You all sound good. Let's do that again. Say, neighbor. It broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. All right, that sounds like a good practice. Now look at your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, it broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. Now take your hand and put it on your chest and say, self, oh, self, it broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. Put your hand over your head and say, oh, head. It might have broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. Let us pray. Father God, move as you see fit. Hide me behind that old rugged cross. Speak, for we, your children, listen. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated even now in the presence of of the Lord. When you consider 45 years of serving, of witnessing, of leading in a community and a city with grace and power, I could not help myself to find myself borrowing the words of an author by the name of Paul Cohello. And the author who endearingly places us as believers in a conundrum shares these words in a book entitled The Devil in Miss Prim. And this is what Mr. Cohello says. When I least expect it, life sometimes sets up challenges to test our courage. It comes to test our willingness to change, 
At such a moment, there is no point in pretending that nothing has happened or in saying that we're not yet ready for the challenge before us. The challenge that we face will not wait for us to get comfortable, to put on life jackets of strength and of peace. But life does not ask for permission when it throws its darts of pain and death and hurt towards us. Life just aims and fires. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel the preachers preaching already. Because I know we're here to celebrate 45 years. And I know it's the church's anniversary. And I know we sing songs and lift up the mighty word that God is able and dependable and assurable. But I want to suggest to someone who's willing to keep it real this afternoon that even though you're celebrating 45 years, life is still tough. Even though you're here today in your Sabbath best, ready to acknowledge the God who's been keeping you when you could not keep yourself, we cannot run from the reality that life is tough. That in moments when you feel comfortable and you feel that you're at your best is the very moment that the devil sneaks up behind you and aims and fires some darts to cause you to question, where is your God? 45 years later. You've been here for a while lifting up the name of Jesus and proclaiming his goodness but life has a way of creeping into your space of being comfortable knocking on your door at your address and inviting itself into your bedroom and throwing things in your face to cause you to ask the question how do I keep journeying when life is so tough the Bible declares that there's someone who feels your pain and his name is Abraham. The Bible declares in Genesis chapter 22 that the Lord had blessed Abraham and Sarah with a beautiful bouncing baby boy by the name of Isaac. And you got to understand for context of the text that if God blessed them with a boy, it was a blessing that was further than what they saw because having a boy meant that that child would be able to assist the family and help with the yard and assist with the grooming of the animals. So it was a great pleasure to hear that Isaac was born. But the Bible declares in Genesis chapter 22 that the same God that blessed Abraham and Sarah with a beautiful bouncing baby boy that they named Isaac. And I know at the surface that may not mean anything to you, but if you entertain the Hebrew, you would realize that Isaac actually is defined as Yitchek, which means his name was Laughter. God bless them with laughter. In moments where they felt they had no laughter, God provided laughter. But how does God hmm, give you a blessing on one hand and on the other hand chooses to tell you, uh, I want you to kill that blessing I just provided to you. Sister Sharon, it ain't easy when God opens up doors and pours out a blessing, but in the same breath shuts those doors and tells you no more. Children, no more. Money, no more. Laughter, no more. Church, no more. What do you do when God stops giving you the thing that you wanted? It's a real question for 45 years later. Because it begs the question, uh, will you be the same faithful person that you've been for 45 years if God doesn't give you the desires of your heart? How do you serve God when your money is funny and your change becomes strange? How do you worship God when you lost a child? unexpectedly how do you serve God when you went through divorce and you still feel like you're divorced even though you're remarried preach pastor I'm trying to 
How do you do what you do uh, and still serve God? Let me tell you how. It's because you trust God despite what you feel and trust him because of what you know. 45 years means that you had some tough times, but you made it through. 45 years means that there's times, uh, elder, where you're looking for a first elder and you couldn't find him. But God said, press on. 45 years means uh, that when you had no money in the bank, that the Lord sent Pastor Campbell this way uh, to create an idea to do something so you had enough money to pay down on a... Oh, the Bible declares that this man named Abraham is going through some real drama. He was blessed yesterday, but now he's challenged today. And the Bible says that it's a test. Come here, Downs, you let's talk. If you're being tested by anybody, it ought to be by God. For if God is testing you, I believe he's the greatest teacher on this earth. And if God tests you, uh, that means you must be test worthy. Test worthy means that it wasn't just anybody teaching you, uh, but God being God, the Alpha and Omega, looked down the corridors of life and said, you're able to deal with cancer. You're able to deal with death. You're able to deal with challenges in your life because I am God and what you don't see, I see. And I'm holding your hand even though you feel alone. I'm holding you up even when you're by yourself. When the church has left you, I'm still there. When friends have forgot you, I'm still there. Am I preaching to anybody in here that sometimes in life when you're at your lowest ebb, God is still there. The Bible declares that Abraham finds himself in a conundrum. For the Lord blessed him and now the Lord is taking away that laughter. And I've learned that sometimes when you're going through something, you have to learn to be deaf to the world. Because if you listen to everybody, <laughs> If you hear everybody and do what they say, you will end up out of your mind. Sometimes you got to just trust God and be deaf to the world. That sounds like three of you, so let me try and grab the rest. We have the youngest in the house, Marvin Jr., and every now and then I try to be that good father and read him a book. I praise God for those three amens. Yeah, some fathers ain't reading books to their children anymore. That's a commercial break for someone else. And so on this day, I, I was reading MJ some books, and I was reading this particular book about frogs. And I know out here you all don't like to talk about frogs, but down in Atlanta, we got a whole lot of frogs. And so, Melvin, on this particular day, I was reading this book about frogs, and Dr. Martin, I was telling him how this frog kept on jumping, and there was a school of frogs jumping, and then one frog messed up and jumped into a pit, and when he landed, Landed in the pit the two other frogs behind him uh, fell in the pit as well sister Bowen and before you realize it there were three frogs in the pit looking up and there were some other frogs around the pit looking down and one frog uh, who was jumping uh, just kept on jumping even though it didn't look like he was gonna jump out and all the frogs around the top of the pit kept on saying just give up because it doesn't look like you're going to make it out and Zephyr to my surprise that one frog I'm looking for one downs you remember that one frog who kept on praising kept on believing kept on worshiping kept on shouting kept on fasting jumped right out of that pit but that's not my shout what my shout is is that an old frog came hobbling along. I'm trying to shout out my old seniors in Downs U Seventh-day Adventist Church. My old frog came hobbling along and she said, you fool, the whole time you were telling that frog to just give up, don't you know that frog is deaf? So he was trying to read your frog lips and the whole time you said, just give up, he was saying, Dr. Martin, I thought you were saying, just get up. 
Sometimes you got to be deaf to the world because the world will hold you back. Be deaf to the people around you because the people are, oh, I wish I had a church in here today. All right, all right. You're cutting into my time. Watch this. The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us in verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. The word says he took two of his servants with him and his son Isaac. When he had enough wood, the word says, and burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about it on the third day. Somebody say the third day. Somebody just missed their shout. The Bible says it was three days later that he was still willing to do what it is that he didn't want to do, but he wasn't trusting himself. He was trusting the God who told him to do something that he was uncomfortable with. Listen to me, Downs, you. If we're going to have another 45 years before God comes, you got to learn to be faithful, uh, not by what you see, uh, but faithful by who you know. The Bible declares he took the three men with him, got enough for the burnt offering. He set out for the place God told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. We will worship, and we'll come back to you. Ah. Some of us should be troubled by that reality. Because from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Genesis 22, never in the history of time has anybody come back from the state of the dead. But here Abraham is speaking a, a prophetic word. He's saying something that makes no sense. He's saying, even if you kill my son, I know it hasn't been done, but you will raise him up. I'm trying to tell someone today on this afternoon that we have to have faith like Abraham for another 45 years. If you're looking in society like I'm looking, well, I'm in America, so it's a whole lot crazy over there. But if you're looking in the world that I'm in, you will notice that there's a whole lot of stuff going on. And before you know it, this church won't be what it is. But in order for we to keep on keeping on for another 45 years, you got to not trust what you see, what you feel, what you think, what is popular. But trust thus saith the Lord. The Bible declares that he says, you two stay here and we'll worship. Come back. Here it is. Every worship experience deserves sacrifice. You may not know it, but as a little boy growing up, I remember, and this may be new for some of y'all, but I remember such stores like Honest Ed's Holler If You Hear Me. I remember such stores like Byway. I remember such stores like Knob Hill Farms. And if you were at Jane and Wilson like I was at Jane and Wilson, you got excited to go to church on Sabbath morning because you knew potentially that Saturday night the whole family was going to Knob Hill Farms. And if you went to, see, I know why they closed that bad boy down. Because when we were there, I'd be taking up grapes. Mama, this look good. I'd be taking some cookies. I said, ooh, this tastes good. I got to tell you, that was a blessing in disguise. <laughs> some of y'all got too excited for Knob Hill Farms. I want y'all. <laughs> but here it is. We as a church, if the journey's going to have to continue, we got to not be caught up on what we feel. We got to support the pastor. Support the pastors. Support the elders. And if you got issues, this is free, commercial for some of y'all. If you got issues, get on your knees and pray it through. But it doesn't help if there's going to be another 45 years that you're fighting uh, the system. It doesn't help if you're always looking for what's wrong and not helping to fix what's wrong. Now let me tell y'all something. 
<laughs> and Pastor King knows, Sister King knows, because they come out to Atlanta a whole lot of times to visit their daughter. We got a whole lot of members at Atlanta Bryn, and I know some of y'all are watching. God bless you too. And at Atlanta Bryn, we got a whole lot of folks that always want to tell you what's wrong. And I tell them every Sabbath, listen, I like your opinion. Now what? We served, we served and celebrated 120 years last year. And some of the same members that have been complaining for 80 years, still complaining. I mean, if I didn't think this was the children of Israel, I wouldn't know what's going on. And I'm trying to tell Downs, you family, listen to me, please. When my parents were bringing us to church here, what made us excited was the community. That's what made this church powerful. We ate out of one Dutch pot. And what Sister Ward didn't like, she passed it down the table to Sister Maria. Do you hear me in here today? We got to learn to love one another and stop judging one another. I don't look like you. I don't talk like you. But guess what? I'm still a child of the king. All right, all right. I know y'all won't invite me back, but I promise you, we call this the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. The text says, the text says, and Abraham told the boys, you stay here while me and my son go and worship and we'll come back to you. There's something in this text that I thought was good revelation for some of us here who are celebrating this 45 years. And this is what it says. The Bible's declaring that Abraham realizes that sometimes having too much people around you actually eclipses the experience of worship. I'm coming down your alley, just make room. What I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes the person sitting next to you actually stops you from worshiping the way you ought to. Hold on. Sister Tina, I'm in the text, I promise you. The Bible says that Abraham tells the two lads, it's in your Bible, you stay here, watch this, with the donkey. I'll come to back later. Hold on, watch this. You stay here, two lads, with the donkey. My son and I are going to worship and we'll come back to you. What I realize is that sometimes Christians don't worship the way they should because they're worried about who's around them. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. You see, if the two lads went with Abraham up to the mountain and he was going to sacrifice his son, the two lads would have interfered with the process that God told him to do what he was supposed to do, and it would have messed up the whole thing. And so Abraham realizes, I'm not going to take you to my worship experience because my worship experience is just too valuable. Now, I'm looking for somebody in God's house today that wants to say, I don't care who's around me. I don't care what clothes are on my back. I don't care if my weave is laid just right. I'm a bless the Lord at all times. And a pray will continually be in my mouth. All right, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Watch this, watch this, watch this. All right, watch this. The Bible says, quite interestingly enough, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, he replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, let me tell you something today. Pastor Affleck is my good friend. I love that brother. This is what we call the real deal like Evander Holyfield. What you see is what you get. And I'm not trying to get no trouble here today. But here's my public announcement. You got to treat your pastor right. And sister Pastor Clark shares my last name as my sister. Treat your pastors right. 
Because across the border, there's a whole lot of folks trying to get good pastors today. Okay. Let me just keep moving here. Okay. Okay. Let me keep moving. The Hammond hears me. If nobody else hears me, the Hammond hears me. Watch this. The text says, as you consider this 45 years of challenging times, you saw the persons that were up on the screen that had died. Folks that we loved. Sister Burke was like my mother. Beautiful. And let me tell you, if anybody can dress, Sister Burke can dress. But the text tells us, don't miss this, please, I beg of you. The text tells us that Abraham gives his son the wood for the burnt offering. He places it on him. And the both of them walk together. And you know what that told me? It told me that sometimes in the journey of life that you continue, sometimes you'll carry the very thing that's supposed to kill you. You know, Sister Tina, we like to say when things are nice, you do it twice. Let me bring it back one more time. The Bible says that Abraham, the father, tells his son that I'm going to put the wood on you that's about to use to kill you. And I'm going to allow you to carry that to the place that we're going to kill you. And I'm suggesting to someone in the journey of 45 years and 45 years to come, that sometimes in, sometimes in life you will carry the very thing that's supposed to kill you. But little do you know that even when it looks like it's going to harm you, the Lord will remix that thing to help you. Okay, okay. You know, I had a feeling that some of y'all weren't going to get this, so let me try and go a different way. Uh, uh, some of y'all know that while I was at Oakwood University, uh, I see you Mario in the house, I, I enjoyed uh, some good food. And you can see by my stature that I enjoy some good food. Don't hate, don't hate, don't hate. And so, and so I had a roommate at the time, uh, his, his, his mom, they were from Trinidad. TNT in the house? Bless the Lord. Yes, yes. Oh, gosh. Okay. So I, I remember, I remember uh, his, his mother, she stayed over and she baked this bread. And if you know me, you know I love some bread. And so I, I was supposed to go to Greek class, Pastor, to learn some kakos peneras, amatia, doulos of theos, san basilia. Yeah, Pastor King, I was supposed to go to class. But, but, but I smelt the bread. And the bread said, Marvin, true story. And I said, yes. He said, come on down and taste this. So I made my way downstairs. And I looked over on the counter, and Pastor Clark, I saw something covered with a towel. Y'all know how you do, the baker's in the house. And I opened up that thing slowly, and I said, hey, bread. And he said, hey, Marvin. I said, man, I'm about to eat this thing. And he said, hold up, wait a minute. He said, I know you're a preacher, so let me give you a word. He said, I wasn't always like this. But there was a time I was just merely flour and the baker came over and threw a little salt on me. Then they poured a little water on me and I sat all by myself covered up by this towel. But the baker came back over a little while later and he took off the towel and started to knead me and pull me and punish me. I didn't know what was going on, but the baker was trying to teach me something. All of a sudden, the baker ripped me in half and put me in a pan over there and a pan over here. I was beside myself, and when I thought it couldn't get any worse, the baker put me on the side by myself, covered me up in a dark space, but I noticed in the dark space down to you, I was rising. And I started to complain, but unbeknownst to me, the enemy was trying to wear me out, but the Lord was saying all things work together for the good for those of them that love the Lord. The baker came over, 
opened up the oven, turned the heat up, put me in the oven. It was hot in there, Marvin. I was uncomfortable. I didn't like the heat. I didn't like the sweat. But I noticed I started to rise. Color got on me. I started filling out the pan and I thought I couldn't take it anymore. But you know good bakers, they open up the oven, stick a knife in you. Let me, let me go over here. They open up the oven, stick a knife in you and tell you we ain't done yet. And they think, is there anybody in here that feels like you learned your lesson? but the baker keeps putting you back in. That's because you ain't ready yet. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up any down through members trying to mount up today. Finally, finally the bread said, Marvin, the baker opened up that thing, took me out. And now you got me on the counter talking about I look good and smell good. I'm trying to tell somebody in God's house today, 45 years has you looking and smelling good. 45 years of having a prayer life has kept you. 45 years of trusting God has allowed you to be in this place. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. All right. I promise I'm almost done. The text says, the text says, and we'll close this thing down. The text says, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it, and he bound his son. Auntie Norma, Auntie Norma, I want you to hear this, Auntie Norma. Even when we're bound, there's still room for deliverance. Bible says help me Jesus then he reached his hand out took the knife to slay his son verse 11 but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven Abraham Abraham here I am he replied verse 12 says do not Lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Here it is. Downs you. There's some things that we're holding back from God. And God doesn't believe that you really, really fear him. There's some things that we're asking God to deliver us from. We're asking God to let go of some things, fix us, transform us, transition us, free us from certain shackles. Listen to me. Some addictions, some love issues. And we're asking God, why can't you free me from this? Here it is. God does not believe you really fear him because some of the things we're holding on to is the very thing that's keeping the blessing from coming to you. The Bible declares that the angel only told him to stop, don't miss this, when he was at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. The Abraham situation is for us at Downs you today is that some of us want a blessing where we are and we're not willing to go where God wants us to be. It is only when he got to the right place doing the right thing at the right time did he hear from the angel. If you want to hear from God, here it is. Do the right thing at the right place at the right time and your deliverance will show up 
All right. The Bible says Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, if you're reading your word like I am, some of you should be troubled by what we just heard. The Bible says that Abraham looked up. He looked up, and when he looked up, he saw a ram caught in the thicket. Now, the trouble with that is that if you're reading the word, you'll notice that Abraham must have passed the location he went up at the mountain to sacrifice his son. He had to pass the place where he saw the ram caught in the thicket. So if he passed the place and the Bible says he looked up, how does the ram show up when he's looking up? Well, I knew I was coming to Pastor Affleck's church and I know that he's a very pronounced and profound preacher, so I had to do some homework. And I realized if you look at it in the original language, you'll realize that he didn't just look up, he actually looked behind him. Somebody said, that's good. And let me tell you why. For those three, that's good. It's good because this suggests that even when you pass the place of a blessing, the God you serve can bring that blessing back. So if you just turn around, it'll be right there waiting on you. Okay, I figured there'll be a nine claps in here. Let me try and grab the rest. The Bible says that the ram is caught in the thicket by its horns. Now, I know that you're sitting up there and looking at me and you're saying, this preacher doesn't know anything about ram, but praise God, my parents took me to West Milan a whole heap of time. Yeah, yeah. So me know a little bit about um, ram, yeah. And you see, ram will ram you if you come close to it. And so I realized that I had a trouble with the tension in the text because if, if the ram was by itself sitting there, there'd be no trouble unless you're trying to touch it. But notice the text says the ram is caught in the thicket by its horns. In other words, God knew, God knew that Abraham needed that ram, so he tied up that ram like a delivery gift waiting for Abraham because Abraham was doing the right thing at the right time. Are you with me, church? The Bible declares that the ram is caught in the thicket, but what troubles the preacher a little further is that rams are never on that mountain. It is confusing because rams were known never to be on that mountain. So in other words, God took that ram from wherever it was. Let me talk to someone real quick. There's some blessings that don't want to be your blessings. But when God calls that blessing, that blessing can't do nothing but to adhere to the voice of God. The Bible says the ram was put in that place by God for Abraham because Abraham was doing the right thing at the right time, at the right place. Today, some of us, we're asking God to show us why is it that we're in this thing 45 years later? What's my purpose? What's my calling? What is it that you're trying to show me? Who am I supposed to be? I'm having challenges in my life, issues, predicaments, and some things, listen, some things are breaking my heart, but we're not allowing it to fix our vision. This is where the sermonic title comes from. While I was at Centennial, which is a high school in Brampton, I enjoyed playing football. I was a nose tackle. My opinion, I thought I was real good. And I remember some of the things we used to do to some kids who were new to the team. When we had to go to practice way out in what we would define as the boonies, 
we would have practice out there. And if there was a new kid, some of me and my friends would do something to him to let him know that he's been initiated into the football team. On this particular day, we took this young guy and we duct taped him to the goalposts. Now, some of y'all are judging me, but I know y'all done worse. Tell the truth and shame the devil. So on this day, I tied that boy up and we were laughing and mocking him. And that young man was crying. We left him out there 11.30 p.m. at night. We went back to the dorm rooms. And I was lying in my bed. And this is why I know God was calling me because my heart was heavy. So I went back out there. And when I went back out there, Dr. Ashley, that boy was gone. You know, back then I was still ignorant. I didn't know about the church. So I thought, you know, what I heard on TV, the rapture got him. That's what we call mixing Christianity with stupidity. But I thought, you know, something took him away. So I went back to the dorm room. I called my friends. I said, hey, 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 Jason's gone. They said, no, 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 he ain't gone. I said, yes, I was out there. He's gone. They went back to sleep. I went to Jason's room and I knocked on the door. Nobody answered, so I opened it. Jason was fast asleep in his bed. The journey broke my heart but fixed my vision. I woke up Jason. I said, Jason, Jason, what happened? He said, Marvin, I was out there and you know it was storming. I said, yes. He said, what I didn't realize was while I was duct taped up, I was praying, God, please deliver me from this. He said, I'm trying to play with these guys on a team, but these guys are trying to hurt me. He said, but Marvin, the more I prayed, the more the rain came. He said, I was confused. Why, why is it raining harder when I'm asking God to deliver me? And unbeknownst to him, the more it rained, the more the water got between the adhesiveness of the duct tape. So the more rain came, it loosened up the duct tape. I hope I'm preaching to someone today, Elder. Sometimes we're saying, Lord, why is this coming to me? But you need to know the more it rains, sometimes it's delivering you. Jason said, Marvin, when I couldn't take it anymore, I tried to move and the rain completely loosened the duct tape. And I praise God all the way back to my bed. And now you see me in here and you're asking me, how did I get here? Guess what? God knows that this broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. And today I know that God sets us free no matter what storm we're going through. So this afternoon, listen to me. Some of us are here celebrating this anniversary. But we're going through a storm. Some of us are dealing with some real issues, challenges, circumstances, disease, distrust, losing our job. But today I declare, Lasburn, that the God that we serve is able, dependable, assurable, trustworthy, a game changer, a healer, a provider. Someone once said, Sister Bowen, won't he do it? Won't he change your situation? Won't he make your enemies your footstool? Won't he give you joy in sorrow? Won't he give you hope in tomorrow? Is he the lily of your valley? The bright and morning star? The way maker? The healer and provider? Can he pick you up? Turn you around? Place your feet on solid ground? Is he able? Is he capable? Can he do it? Has he done it? Is he here today? What's his name? We call him Emmanuel. God with us. We call him the great I am. We call him the wheel in the middle of the wheel. I'm looking for 20 people in here that will declare to the enemy, you should have kept me down. You should have kept me out. You should have killed me. But when God is for me, who can be against me? When God sets me up, no man can tear me down. I love him. 
I worship him. He is who he is. Somebody say yeah. This afternoon, listen to me, listen to me. This afternoon, this word means absolutely nothing. If you don't choose to partner with Christ today. So this afternoon, listen to me. The first appeal is simply saying this. I need God now. That's it. I need God now. If that's your story, I need you to be really bold today. Step out of the pew and come down here. Let's, let's join together like the old downs you. Side by side, we stand. Y'all remember them days? We used to have prayer meeting and we would surround this place with holding, linking hands, asking God to deliver us. Who's walking by faith this afternoon? Here's a second appeal. Here's a second appeal. There's an issue. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. We're really good at pretending that life is perfect. But let me tell you something. Just in case you don't know, nobody's life in here is perfect. Not the preacher. Not you. Nobody's life. In other words, we all need Jesus. This afternoon, here's a second appeal. If there's a challenge in your life and you need God to do something miraculous, I mean out of this world, just like he did for Abraham and Isaac. If that's your story, walk by faith. Come on down. Come on down. God sees you, who you are. God bless you, my sister. You need him to do a miracle right now. You know who you are. You know who you are. You need that miracle right now. Could that praise team come and help me out with that? Yeah. All right. Here's the third appeal. Sing, praise team. Sing, sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the third appeal. Listen to me. You used to be a part of this church. But for whatever reason, church hurt has kept you away. You might be in my age bracket where you feel that there's been a disconnect. But I want to encourage you today. Listen to me. The church is still the greatest place for us. Trust me. If you're here today and you left this church, you're no longer a part of this church, but you want to reconnect back with this church. If that's your story, just raise your hand, whoever you are. Come on, come on, be bold this afternoon. Come on, come on, be bold this afternoon. God bless you, I see your hand. I see your hand. Listen to me. If your hand was up, and I know you slipped it up and slipped it back down, but I need you to reach out to the pastor. Reach out to Pastor Affleck, Pastor Clark, and let them know that you want to join this thing again. You want to be back under the armor and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in this church. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Listen, I need you to hold the hand of your neighbor. Hold the hand of your neighbor. Hold the hand of your neighbor. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Today, if you're a guest and you want to be baptized, you want to have a closer walk with Jesus Christ. You want to understand a little bit about who God is and what God has for your life. You want to search the scriptures and be a part of a movement that is transforming the world one sermon, one song, one prayer at a time. If that's your story, just raise your hand, whoever you are. You want to be a part of the church? You want to be baptized? You want to know God for yourself. If that's you, just raise your hand. God bless you, my sister. I see you. Somebody else. Come on, come on. You're visiting here. You're not comfortable to do anything more. But you want to say, Jesus, just see my hand. Just see my hand on this anniversary. I really want to be with you. God bless you, my brother. I see your hand. 
Is there someone else? Someone else. You just want to raise your hand and say, God, I'm crying at night. I'm struggling at night. I got problems. I'm addicted to certain things. And I want to be free today. If that's your story, just raise your hand. Jesus, see me. See me. See me. See me, Jesus. I see your hand, my brother. See me, Jesus. I'm talking to a parent today. You're trying to tell your children about Jesus, but you're struggling. There's no better time to be honest with God than right now. Just raise your hand, whoever you are. I see you, my sister. God bless you. I see you, my sister. I see you, my sister. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. 45 years, oh God. 45 years. We've lost so many soldiers. We've witnessed so much pain. But Lord, you've brought us a mighty long way. Some of us should have been dead, lost our minds. Some of us almost did lose our minds. But Lord, you kept us. Lord, some of us were diagnosed with things. Some of us were in car accidents. Some of us dealt with some things that we don't want nobody else to know about. But Lord, we're standing. Lord, we're holding on. Some things have hit us, oh God, that we can't even speak out loud. But Jesus, you know. And you don't just know, but you've rescued us. You've dried our tears. You've healed our wounds. You've given us blindness so we wouldn't see too much. You caused us to be deaf so we wouldn't hear too much. You've allowed us to sit in certain pews so we wouldn't be exposed to too much. Thank you, God. Lord, we ask on this afternoon that, Lord, you'll reveal yourself more and more for another 45. We ask, oh God, that those that are still here that are passing the baton will be good patriots. That will say, not my will, but thy will be done. We pray for our seniors who we affectionately call our VIP, very important people. We pray, oh God, that you'll begin to massage and heal and ratify and bring back and restore, oh God, the spirit that they need so they can keep teaching keep preaching keep reaching and keep leading lord we pray for the young and young adults those who have their own families now once were sitting in the pews on the laps of their parents are now standing on the stage leading in front of their parents we ask oh god that you'll bring some clarity to mind that lord help them to realize yes they do need a good house Yes, they do need a good car. Yes, they do need to have trips and go on wonderful vacations. But they need to be a part of the church. And they need to show thyself approved. So now, Lord, because we know that you're able to do all things, like Pastor Clark mentioned earlier, exceedingly and abundantly, more than we can ask. We ask, oh God, that you'll have thine way with everybody in this place and those that are worshiping with us online. So now, Lord, uh, we squeeze the hand of our neighbor this afternoon. We squeeze it saying, I'm going to stand by you as you stand by me. We squeeze it a second time to say, I won't harm you, but I'm going to pray for you. We squeeze it a third time to say, we can only make it through the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we squeeze it a last time to say the only way we can celebrate 45 years is to be the best version of this church, of a man, a woman, a boy, and girl that God has called us to be. So now, Holy Spirit, until the second coming comes, save us seal us keep us heal us help us restore us bless us 
order our steps. Order our stops. Give us a new mind. Give us a new heart. Give us a new spirit. Go to our houses now. Heal our bedrooms. Heal our living rooms. Heal our kitchen tables. Go to the job site. Be with our bosses. Be with our colleagues. Be with our desks. Be with our cars. Be with us, oh God. Be with our enemies. And let the Lord have thine own way. As we continue this journey, this we pray in Jesus' name. Let all of God's people say amen and amen again. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it broke my heart, but it fixed my vision. God bless you.